today. That's two in a row, forward. Huh? Two in a row. Yeah. Forward hat. Yeah. Um, how are you? Goss today, but good. Coffee's Late night. Good, man. Late night. Late night. It's amazing what a bad, not a bad, I had a good good sleep, but for me staying up late, man, it's oatmeal and oatmeal between the ears mm-hmm. the next day. North of the eyebrows and between the ears. Yeah. Oatmeal. Sleep. Yeah. I'm great. Yeah. I was flying yesterday. I've been sleeping great. Yeah. Last couple nice. evenings. Yeah. You know what it is too is here's a little little tip for everyone. If you don't eat for like two three hours before you go to sleep, yeah. Wow, do you sleep way better? Huge. Wow, do you sleep way better? Yeah. It's not even close. Yeah. It's not even comparable. I know. My recoveries are through the roof because I'm not. E- I'm not saying you have to do what I do, but I don't. My last. I'm definitely done eating by five p.m. It's hard. So it's for me. It's actually even longer. It's like four, sometimes almost five hours before I go to sleep, and it's just awesome. It feels so good. And it's like people say, "Oh, I can never do that," or "I need to eat something before I'd be so hungry," or whatever. But it's like anything. You you, yeah. if you're used to eating at ten p.m. five seconds before you go to bed, don't stop at three tomorrow. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Just you can slowly yeah. claw it back, and yeah. you notice a difference, man, with the sleep. Knock it feels an hour good. off. Yeah. Here and there. Here don't have to there. be so extreme. <laughs> don't have to be so extreme, yeah. man. Low hanging right. fruit. Yeah, low hanging fruit. That's it. Don't As totally challenge yourself. I know. Yeah. Okay. So you ever? I'm sure you've done this assessing your game or assessing a player's game, or you watch someone and you say, "Oh, that was a good game," or yeah. "That was a great game." Do you think parents do that? Uh, selectively, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, coaches and players obviously mm-hmm. do that, right? So. And it's funny what you set your standard at. Okay? Mm. Guilty with it with my own kid until you put it in perspective. Um, so if you play whatever, a percentage of games, and let's say you're playing pretty good, and then all of a sudden you have a game or your son or your someone that you're watching or you're scouting or whatever has a game that's like off the charts. Is that the standard that you say, oh, okay, that's – what a lot of parents – my point is a lot of parents are saying, okay, that's the way you know how to play. You hear mm-hmm. that a lot, right? Yep. That's the way you know how to play. Yeah, that's your game. You finish. Yeah. So let's just say you're a Bantam midget junior, whatever. You finished every hit. You won, you know, got in the battles. You had shots on net, made plays, back checked hard. Everything was like perfect. And it's like, that's the way you should play. And then all of a sudden the standard is there. So I was, so, um, so I was listening to Martin St. Louis, who coaches Montreal now. I don't need to explain who Martin St. Louis is, I, I wouldn't think. And he was talking about, uh, self-assessing and he goes the most important thing about self-assessing your game is at being very very truthful so that's number one being very truthful so you can look and say no i was just not very good today or whatever right he said but uh if you think about it like this he goes if you play uh, when you play the game you're gonna have 50 percent of your games roughly roughly 50 percent of your games are going to be um the player that you are okay so you're either a really good player or your average or whatever. That's the type of player you are. 25% of the games that you play roughly are going to be those games where you go with the standard, the standard that we just set, like that's how you play hockey. And then 25% the other way will be, it's a little bit less than what your average is. Right. That, that kind of makes sense, right? Bell curve, man. Makes yeah, the sense. bell curve. Yeah. So I think a lot of the times, like, so when, when like, I'm, I'm just saying this for because it, like, when you when you look at a, a season as a whole, it, it's easy to point out the three games that were great, and the th- three dog shit games to forget about the the your average game, like in what what you really are like. So when you have an exceptional game, it's like one of that twenty five percent. And obviously, if you play kind of below average, you're at the lower end of the 25%. You're just a little bit off. So I think that's actually a good thing for people to understand. Like if you want to coach, when a coach sees someone have a great game or a parent or whatever, when they see the, the great game, it's like that's that's one out of four or something like that, right? One out of three. And uh, and then if you see a game where it's just not there, totally, you're just you're not playing bad, but you're not playing whatever. It's like you don't rip on them. Right, because that's just kind of the way life is. So I, I really, I really thought about that. I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I didn't think of it in a numbers term. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. And then, uh, and then there was uh, someone else I heard say, 
that you know and and i like this too is like there's some games where you're just you, you stink you just, you're not you're not having a good game nothing's working it was you don't want to let that happen more than one in ten yeah and that's a pretty good that's, that's a pretty good uh analogy oh that's i like that a lot that's that's a really good uh it's a really good opening actually because we talk about a lot how uh you you more than i do but i also believe it is that um sports just teach you a lot about life and a lot of people say that right but then you forget that the you forget some of the life things and how they apply to sport because it's like it goes both ways right so sports can teach you a lot about life but then there's a lot of life things that are the same in sport but people forget so most of your days if you have like your regular your regular life are just like they're fine like they're good exactly like they're, they're not fantastic and they're not bad they're right. just like yeah, it was it was good. And if you're a more positive person, you'll be like, yeah, my day was good. If you're a more negative person, you'll say, yeah, whatever, like it was fine. But the average is the average, right? The, the average thing, is things the average. are average for a reason. So because the majority is the average. So then we get into the domain of sports, and that's a really good point. Like parents will say, well, if you have your best game ever, it's like you got to play like that every day. You got to play like that every game. It's like, yeah, but you actually can't because that's not how life works, <laughs> you know. So it's it's important that you don't forget those those parallels between life and sports. So when you're watching your kid play, like is every day that you have at work your best? Is every day that you have with as a dad or as a mom your best? Is every day you know? So it's like yeah. you throw is the every ex- party you go to the best party ever. Yeah, right. Right. So it's like if you if, if you make the expectation that the kid has a fantastic outlier game. And you harp on that so much, like that was such a great game. Like this is the way you got to play all the time. You know, this is the bar. Like you got to meet this. It's like that can't be the expectation. Especially you when know? you understand there's a lot of variables that go into that. Hundred percent. Like you could be just, playing a team that just works for you, and you were on the the best night, and your line mates were clicking, and mm-hmm. like there's a lot of variables yeah. that could that make a difference of whether how how well you play. And that's the same as your job. Like you go to work, you go to work, and your boss comes in and yells at you at at nine forty five a.m that'll set you off for the rest of the day and now your day is no good, you know, or you go in and everything went right for three hours, the first three hours of the day. And it's like, wow, that was an awesome day. It's like, yeah, but that's not the norm. That's not what normally happens either way. Normally it's just, it's good or it's fine or it's average, you know? So I think that's a really, that's a really, really good thing to point out because people forget that. And, and you can tell in the way that they communicate when a kid has a really great game or whatever, it's all of a sudden the bar is there and that's not what the expectation should be. Right. Yeah, so I, I thought that was really good. It really it, it stuck with me, and yeah, I very uh, good. I like it because um, it gives me something like when a kid talks to me, like that's a that's a tool I can always throw at them, right? Like kind of when you're tool assessing belt, man, yourself, nice. be very very honest about yourself, mm-hmm. but don't be an idiot about it, right? So yeah. if you have a game that you, let's say you had the worst game you played in a long long time, it's like don't be depressed. Like that's what you have to really learn how to park those, mm-hmm. right? But at the same time you have to be able to assess that you you were just horrible. And that's like, you can't let that game happen again for quite a while. And for coaches too. A hundred percent. That's what I mean. Right. 100%. Because if you, if you have a, you know, you're, you're maybe second or third best player and they have a great game where they had three goals or, and they're just all over the ice doing everything you want them to do. And now that is what you expect of that kid. And anything less, you are maybe, maybe you punish him because he's not playing up to what you've seen before. It's that can't be where the line is drawn, you know? So I think that's, I like that, that 25, 50, 25 kind of, it's the, it's the bell curve. It's the same thing. Most of the games, they're going to be good enough. And because that is how kids play, depending on obviously their level. If it's a, if you have a third line player, most of their games are going to be good enough for a third line player. You know, if you have a second or first line player, same thing. And then a little more, a little less should be what's expected. It shouldn't be the more is always expected. And I think coaches a lot of times can be guilty of doing that. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. But what, so I, that kind of leads into what we're talking about today. Uh, accidentally on purpose. Um, because I, w- I had um, one of my consultations last week or two weeks ago or three, whatever it was. Um, the player was, um, went to talk to his coach and this, so that's what the call was about. Like, talked to my coach and the coach gave me nothing, like literally nothing. Like said the something fl- very flippant and the kid's like, but that's the question. I just want to, I want to learn something. And the coach was like, eh, you know, so he gave him, I'm not going to repeat what he said, but just nothing. 
So uh, that was the, the thing we talked about a little bit. And I, I said, well, the best way for me to help you with this is to give you actual feedback. Uh, I gave him some principles first. And I said, some actual feedback would be for me to, if you can put together some clips. So they did. They did. It was great. They gave me 20 clips. And uh, 20 is too much because it, because after you see a certain amount of clips, you see yeah, the type of player just, that someone yeah. is, and it's but but that's it's all good. So I, I went through them all, and then I analyzed eleven or twelve with them, but it was kind of the same thing. So that's what I did, and I, and and he happened to be a winger, so I, I just we'll, we'll go with that today and, and do a series on different positions, right? So it was very helpful for me. He was very thankful, and so so the point of this is, as we do this, I know there's going to be a couple of visuals here, so the people that are just listening on the radio, you obviously won't be able to see it. Radio on the radio. What am I? <laughs> Born in 1926. <laughs> I don't even, was there a radio around in 26? I don't even know about that. The transistor radio. <laughs> <laughs> it's like saying the telephone. Now. And what, um, how did the old, old radios run? What were they on? The tube things? I forget what they were called. Transistors? No, 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 no. Tube wait. thing. What is a tube thing? What's a tube thing? Anyways. Oh. Um. Yeah, so if, if so if you're listening, you can't see. Yeah, if you're listening, you can't see. <laughs> yeah, on the radio. So there'll be a couple of visuals here. Visuals here, um, but um, the principles are, are are if if you do these things, like so. I'm not talking if you're playing for the Montreal Canadiens. I'm not talking about if you're playing for uh, the uh, you know the Sarnia Sting or the Boston College because the systems change a bit, but the principles are basically the same. Yeah. Like if you do these things, so my point of saying that is that. Even though you're not having, you may not be having a great game, the foundation and the basics of what you should do well and hard will should always be there, which makes your worst game probably not your worst, like the worst of that it could be or better than it, than it could be. Yep. Right. And then, um, and then it makes it, it, it's habits that'll take you through hockey. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I want to throw just for other people too, because I don't know how I'm going to t- like the title of the episode and whatever, but when people sift through, they oftentimes they'll, they'll pick things that apply more to them. So if I title this one with winger in it, let's say, then maybe if you're not a winger, you think that it doesn't matter. But we talk a lot about, I made a note about it too, is that you, you want to, we've talked about this before. You want to understand all the positions because it can help you be better at a different position. You know, because you can think the game from the other side. So, and a lot of the principles that we talk about cross over. And there's a lot of situations because hockey is a very fluid game. You might find yourself on the wall where a winger is. You might find yourself in the defensive zone having to do a switch where now you're playing high or whatever. So it's good to know and pay attention to these things because there's going to be a crossover between positions. And you might find yourself either offensively or defensively able to use relate or exploit that thing that you've learned from listening to it so i think it's just good it's not just good foundations for a winger it's good foundations for just anyone that's playing hockey to understand so i yeah. just want to throw that yeah on. like if i say and i would probably throw this out there later if i say like on a four check uh, you want to get there quick why to take away time and space well that doesn't that still applies for a d right if you take away someone's time and space that gives them less opportunity to make play yeah, for sure right yeah. so yeah so did you want to start with a question um i can start with a question before i start with the question i'm gonna sneak in the the podcast thing again before we get before we get going um so you're talking about the console thing so uh membership stuff is buzzing still which is cool and the people that are joining like use the consult man it's there for you guys to use because a lot of you guys are joining and there's a big button right there when you log in that says schedule consult. So don't be nervous about it. If you guys want to use it, I know you're more than happy to talk to as many people as possible all, all day, <laughs> every day for 24 hours yeah. a day. Yeah. So, but no, seriously, if you guys are interested in doing that, it's there. And uh, we just got loaded up with all our store stuff. So the store stuff's going to be coming in the next two weeks. I'm going to do a couple test orders and then, uh, but everything's here. So maybe next week I'll show you guys some of the merch stuff that you can get live on the podcast. Um, but yeah, the, the consult stuff is probably the most significant. Cause as we, you're going to reference it a bunch today when we're talking about it too. So if you find, if you have like other questions or things surrounding this kind of stuff, this is what's nice when you actually get to talk to one of us because we can address your specific thing. Um, because a lot of times people will not, they can't necessarily extract what you said in a different question to apply to their situation, even though it's kind of the same answer. 
So sometimes it's helpful to get your specific thing answered if you don't if you find like maybe your exact question hasn't been specifically addressed or whatever. So that that's an option for you guys. Um, so with that kind of teeing up, I wanted to just kind of talk about some of the maybe some of the general general things about more wingers in particular. And you can start um, you can start with whatever zone you want with the puck without the puck whatever. But just some general principles of being effective as a winger. And then maybe a little bit, if you can touch on different winger, like different types of wingers, like different roles for wingers. So we, we talk about, you know, there's certain roles you can have, whatever, a power forward, more of a playmaker, more of a shooter, whatever. Um, but as a, as a winger, there's even like a further breakdown. If you're somebody who maybe plays a more rough and tough or you're a bigger guy, typically they throw those kind of guys on the wing. But they have other players, too, that maybe don't play like that, but they're still wingers. So maybe we can address if you're a little bit more or less physical and a little bit talk about that a little bit if it comes up with the flow. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah, so for sure. maybe we'll start with that. Just kind of some general general thoughts about like the foundations kind of, of being a good winger. Yeah. Well, OK, I'll just go to that consult that I did last week. Like the number one thing was that stood out to me was that it's the general principle of hockey. OK, like and, and the more that people understand this, it's not doesn't sound fun. But it's like it, common sense. No, nah, maybe not common, but anyways, is it's what you do without the puck. Is what will what will help you be around the puck, mm-hmm. right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, can I, just let me interrupt again. Yeah. Quick, sorry. Just bef- even before you get into that, that this is this is more like a message for parents and even young players. Hockey is not just the skills of hockey yeah and that's really important to understand because everyone gets really hung up on the things you pay attention to that you see in clips and on tsn and the highlights where someone has a really great display of skill and people think that's hockey but that's not hockey that isn't what the game is the game is much more when you don't have the puck or the systems how to think the game that is what makes you good at hockey it's not just the skill part So people need to start to pay attention to that. And the younger you can start thinking in those terms of how to actually play the game properly, or as a parent or coach, you can start to teach that it's not just about your toe drag. It Uh, leaves you a lot better off in all, all the positions. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. It's um, yeah. So it's what you do without the puck. And it was very evident with me, with this uh, young guy. And, And we're talking, I think 12, 12 year old kid. So, um, and of course you don't know that you want to play hockey and that's to your point exactly is like what the people practice and the, you, and, and I want to go back to that for a second is cause I said that to, to this guy as well. I said, and you should practice your skills. Right. You, you want to be the best skater possible. You want to be agile. You want to be quick. You want to be powerful. You want to be able to turn on a dime. So that's, uh, and you want to have great balance. You want to be able to perform on those feet, like in any situation, the best that you can. So that's the hands and the shooting and all stuff. You have to do it because if you play a position, if you play your position well, like away from the puck, when you do have the puck, then you can actually do something. So it's, um, you know, it, it's, I it will never minimize being a really good skilled player, but as to your point, having skill without like, it's, it's like having a tool without a toolbox. Right. Um, and that's like a lot of guys play hockey and they've got, they can only do things on pylons or they only can play with a puck a little bit. And it's like, okay, you're missing a whole piece because I mean, beating a dead horse here to, to, to a certain extent, but when you really analyze your game, like just, you know, people over, even overestimate, if you say, how long do you have the puck on your stick in a game? And people overestimate that and say, Oh, maybe uh, three minutes in a game. It's like, no, like, no, not at all. Like a really, really good player will have it a lot less than that. And I don't know what the number is. But it's it's less. In fact, I think I think some of the studies are like seven seconds in a game. Most people or some people have the puck on their stick. A good player, maybe ten, mm-hmm. and of course maybe more. I mean, they look at my son's team, and there's you know, it's not three minutes. That's a long right. time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so it's like if you don't have the puck, how are you a good player? So I remember, I remember. Uh, um, like years and years ago when I was uh, working with like the guys like Matt Pumple and Zach Cassian, when they were in their youth, like minor midget and stuff. I remember one of the agents saying, uh, you know, one of the things you got to get better is without the puck. And I go, yeah, 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 I, I agree. And, but when they tell the kids that they say it, like 
just be better without the puck. And what do, what do you think a 14 year old kid says when they say that? Whatever. What does that mean? What does that mean? Yeah. But they're too nervous to say, what do you mean by that? And then a lot of times when people explain that, it's like, well, just without the puck, you got to be better. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's still not an explanation. Yeah, not an so yeah. so they can be confused. So it's, so anyways, the point is when you don't have a puck, what are you doing? And is it, is it effective? So yeah. I, I'm going to give you some things here that help you with that. So yeah, yeah. go ahead. I think the other, I mean, this is a, a, something that's irritating to me too with scouts and coaches and stuff. They throw out things that like one of my favorite, one of my favorite things is when scouts or team personnel throw out things that kids should work on in the gym. Like they'll be like, you should, you know, put on 15 pounds of muscle over the summer. It's like, you don't even know what that means or how to do that. Work so, your feet. Yeah. Like, get your footwork. Out. So it's not, and, and some of the, some of the coaches, I remember talking to one coach that was, was in here. He was coaching in, uh, I think Oshawa and Ottawa. And he was saying how it's not, his job isn't to know that your job is to know that. And that's at the coming from like the more professional level, which he's right. You know, at him as the coach, it's not his job to know how to best get you to understand your fitness level and your weaknesses to work on them in the best way. That's your job as a professional. But when the kids are young, it's not their job yet. They don't know the difference. So you have to be able to give them something that actually means something. You can't just say, be better without the puck. That doesn't mean anything. It's too non-specific. So if you want them to learn something, you have to be able to teach them some of that stuff. So before before you keep going, the there's two episodes we did in the past, and I was just I was skimming through just to see them. And a lot of people that listen now haven't listened to those, and I think they're really good. The, uh, one was episode 38, and that was how to play without the puck. And that was kind of just a general frame. Some of the things that we talk about today will be repeated in that. And the other one was episode 82 is Hockey IQ. And that kind of touched a lot of the same topics because playing when you don't have the puck at whatever position, that is understanding hockey. And that is, which is Hockey IQ. Understanding what to do in certain situations with or without the puck. That's what Hockey IQ is. And like you said, if you don't have the puck more than a minute in a game or more than 30 seconds in a game, the vast majority of your time on the ice is when you don't have it. And if you're lost, then you'll be no good, <laughs> right? So it's important that you understand that. So I don't know if you want to start with, uh, want to start with D-Zone or what do you think? Well, I was going to start just the real simple thing is yeah. like game starts with a face-off. Yeah, great. This game great. starts with a face-off every yeah. single time. You know, a lot of people say like you win face-offs, you get possession. And that's very true. But not but, and, and or but, one mm -hmm. of the two. Um the thing is, is when you when you're taking a face off, um, if if you're not in a good position, if you win or lose, uh, can make the de difference of keeping possession or a turnover. So, like one of the rules of thumb that I had when I coached, and again, I'm talking, I'm not talking the NHL because when you get there's certain teams that they say it doesn't matter, this is what we're doing, and win or lose, this is what the, the face off is. But whatever. So, but my principle was as a, a winger, as a centerman too is always take a face off as if you're going to lose or it's like at least a 50 50. so for a winger if puck is dropped and you jut out to the, the the boards right and you leave your man open well that and, and you lost the draw well then or you or you win the draw no if you lose the draw then you're uh you're in a bad position to defend so right off the hop you're you're uh, no good to your team mm -hmm. so my my term that i use with uh, on a face off was to squeeze so act as if so it takes two seconds and then you can decide after the once once the puck has been moved like if it goes back to your d then you can get out to the boards or whatever your route is for that team so but if you don't get tight to that guy and squeeze him out then that 50 50 puck if it is a 50 50 puck you could lose that battle mm -hmm. or you just be out of position if the other team has possession yeah, maybe do you want to do maybe an example of a uh, of like a D zone face off, neutral zone face off, O zone face off kind of thing? Uh sure. Let me see. Let me see if I can. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, so this is basically, if I'm a, I'm, I'm this is me. I'm a right winger, mm -hmm. and this is her left winger. The face off gets one here. If I or if the face off gets one back here, and I'm already out here because I face off dropped, I got you excited. Released, yeah. There's a, there's your opening. Yeah. Right? So when the puck is dropped, just squeeze them out. Just take the inside lane on them. Right. That's it. And hold them up. Okay. For so a then second. if we contrast that with, let's say, a D zone draw yep. now. So if I'm same thing, left winger on the D zone, yep. now I'm not, I'm not just trying to lock that. Is guy. this a D zone? Here? Yeah. D zone, whatever. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah so yeah, if I'm doing, if I, so now, because my job is now that defenseman, yep. it's not that winger now. Yep. Right? That's right. So maybe just touch that a little bit. 
because now we're not just stopping with that guy that's in the middle. We're trying to get out to that D, right? Yeah, this, yeah. So you're taking that, that lane just straight out to the D, flexing out. That's that's it. Yeah. So we're not we're not trying to lean on that guy that's going to be right next to us on that face off. Is my point. Yeah, yeah. So that's true. the difference, right? Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. So yeah, you're on your left when you're going to the to the left wall. Yeah, you're not you're not pissing around here. You're looking for maybe a loose block to kick out, but your first job is to get out. Right. Here. So that's I'm just making that contrast yeah. when you're if you're maybe ozone neutral zone for face-offs you're thinking more don't make it easy on that guy getting through you but d zone you're trying to get out to that d so it's not the it's not the same lock up with that guy you're trying to get to that d because that's your man now yeah. right yeah exactly yeah cool so that's 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 number one so i'm a right winger here so we're, remember the your defense is probably tying up this winger so when that puck is dropped you're not thinking like you're thinking defense first so typically that's your route is to get out to the D, right? So if the puck is lost and that's your main, if, if you lose the draw, their team wins it to their D or to this winger here. Sometimes guys put guys right on here. The faster you get there, the, the, the more or the less time and space that this guy has, this D or the winger, whoever they have there, uh, has to make a play. So now you've, you've, because you thought defense first, you've made yourself a better player. Whereas it's, instead of worrying about the puck, be where the puck goes and stuff, you have a job. So this is what I'm talking about. If everyone has a job and this is where you have to trust each other as a team, this D is locking up this guy the best he can. This centerman's tying up a guy and it allows you to do your job properly. So that's just the thing. So you get there urgently. I'm all over the map here. You get there very, very quickly with your stick down. And with the, uh, and then, so the good thing is, is that if you do win the draw, you're already in a good position to, to be on the offense. If, if, if you win the draw and it, it gets kicked out to you. Yeah. The, the, I wanna, That's the important thing. That's what good defense will translate into. I was just going to say offense. that, right? Cause even, yeah. even off that draw, if you're, if you're D or if you guys win the face off, you're already on your way to the wall anyways, where you would need to go. So I think that's, that's a good thing to understand too. It's not just about defense is defense it's your defense will translate to quicker offense and better offense because you're already going to be in a decent position right so that's uh that's a good point there okay so that's a little bit on face-offs do you want to go from face-offs maybe to some some breakouts or do you want to talk about um do you want to talk about just d-zone in general or d-zone coverage but so so i'll give you a, th a thing here so d-zone the four things i kind of wrote down was uh d-zone coverage uh being a supporting role face-offs and breakouts so we just did face-offs yeah so i don't know if do you want to do one of those other four or just talk well about I, I think it all ties into one okay yeah so Go ahead. here's here's the biggest thing i i find that in youth hockey or as guys as guys get older when they're tired or they become a little bit lazy or a little bit impatient that's where things fall apart okay yeah, so in, oh, wait, you want to try something just put it sure. back on the table yeah. Okay, so in your D zone, let's just say I'm a right winger. I'm using right because I'm on the closer to the right side. Okay, mm -hmm. so basically in in your own zone, and I, this is like the foundations. Things can change, and this, different systems can be different systems. Um, but the bottom line is, you're responsible for 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 this area here, right? You got the D, so you've got the D, you've got the high slot the dot and really if you look at that there's not that much skating not a lot of skating and then the wall okay it's not a lot you've got a quarter of the ice basically that you have to take care of and if you understand that that that's very very helpful to just understand that okay so now just because it's not a lot of ice definitely doesn't mean that it's not a lot of work okay but then there's a lot of patience and sometimes the patience takes a lot of work okay so if so with this one one guy that i was working with uh, in video let's say he was a right winger let's say the puck was over in this quadrant of the ice or behind the net or whatever so where he should be is taken away like in that home plate what a lot of people call this the home plate where he should be is there with a stick down and or to the middle of the ice and head on a swivel to look where loose guys are but if he starts drifting too much here, unless you're doing like an over um, uh, a swarm, where if they some coaches yeah. will say system specific, system but in specific, general, we're talking yeah. in general, in yeah. general, 
you're safe here and you got a D here, so you don't have to move a lot. Just be ready. What happened was with, with this guy was watching and then he would just start slowly, just started drifting out just slowly because he's watching the game and he's getting excited. Oh, maybe it's going to come loose or whatever. And he would be like, actually at times outside. So if the D was here, he was outside the D. So we're talking 12, right? Yep. So he's not an idiot. He just doesn't, hasn't been taught this yet. Mm-hmm. So the key is to be patient here because this is the, this is the thing. If the puck squirts loose anywhere in this area, he's only like a few steps away, right? right? Whereas if he's over here, it's a lot of work to do the skating. Okay, so so that's number one. So so I I want to point out because you can erase it, but I yeah. want to point out when you what you said before how because I talked about I said D zone coverage supporting and breakouts and what you just pointed out there is all three of those things. So if you're in a good position in the middle as the winger, that means that you're covering yeah. your D. So that if you're in that spot, yeah, you're covering your D. Yep, yeah. which is great. You're in a good supporting role if a puck squirts loose, which is great. That's exactly it. And you can also quickly release for a breakout if the puck goes somewhere else. Yes. So all three of those things, to your point, are yes. covered right under there. one category just because you're in a good position defensively on the ice, right? Right. So I just want to I want to throw right. that out. So where where guys fall apart maybe on this side is that if if there's a lot of play in this area creeping out this way or creeping too much this way. Mm-hmm. So now if there's a rim or something like that, it's too much skating. Mm-hmm. So it's patience here. Head on a swivel and waiting for that second to pounce. Yeah. So so I remember this actually being a problem with myself in, in minor hockey. I remember that fade, that fading yeah. thing yeah. where you just get puck watching. Yeah, so coming out here. I would say, may, maybe correct me if you don't agree, but I would say for for wingers, have have a mark on the ice that can keep you centered. So you Just so you have a mental cue. Because if you don't actually have something that is going to hold you to a spot or around a spot or or something to remind you where you need to be, yeah. then it's easy to start puck watching and start drifting. So yeah. especially when you're younger, if you use like ha- top of the hash marks, top of the circle in that area, use that as a mental check. So if you're D zone and, and to your point, if it's a patient point of defensive zone where it's on your off wing and you're not really involved in the play necessarily, mm-hmm. you'll have a marker on the ice where you can kind of check that you're in the right spot. If you start to drift, you can get back or, and that's how yep. you can start to correct it if you're not used to thinking about it, right? Yeah. Yeah, and dot, to me, dots and hash marks are real good. Yeah. So so just to finish off on here, so now let's just say the D or the center or the winger ends up getting a puck and you get possession. And this is where people don't understand as well is that this coming up through the middle here like this or, or the middle here is a lot easier to make a play than you going out here or outside the dots. Mm-hmm. Right? That's hard because there's people there. Right? Yeah, a lot of space, a lot yeah. of people, hard pass to yeah. make for sure. So the other thing is, what I was saying to him is, so if the play's down in this corner, more or less, if you're outside the dots, well, that's, to defend, you want to keep guys outside the dots. That's number one. But if you are outside the dots and the and this D just happens to go here, and this is what happened, right? The puck would come out here and it was like a big battle to get there. That's a lot of hard work. Whereas he could have just stepped one one or two steps and lane. taken away that. Mm-hmm. So... Um, so, so that's that, that's the number one in your own zone is right there. So do you want to touch on, on shot blocking a little bit? Might well, be a good conversation. The, the, the thing is, is, um, when you go out, you, you just, you basically just want to get in a shot lane. So when you go out there, you want your stick on the ice or, you know, like and get the shin pads out there and just go out there fast. The bottom line with that is when you go out to a D fast and you, you're, it's not a long distance. So as I said before, I think was it's taking away time and space from people. So mm-hmm. if, if like, for example, if there's a D here and you're a, a winger down here, if you have to go all the way out, you know, maybe 20, 30 feet rather than 15 feet, you just made his job a lot easier. So like you take away time and space. The important thing about that is when you come at him fast in a short distance, he, he, unless he's like elite, 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 he doesn't have time to think or see other plays. So you're, 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 you're doing your job. You're making his job very hard mm-hmm. where your job is like a little bit more easy. Yep. Right. And if you can ever take angles, angle them out a little bit. So you want to yeah. angle them out, Flush but, to but, but, to, the but to block a shot, you want to get out there fast, stick on the ice and, and get out there. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, the, ne- the next part on your, uh, on your D zone would be if it is on your strong side and this is where things fall apart. Like I, I this is my opinion or, this is what I've seen a lot. So let's just say you're a right winger. Okay. Right winger here. 
and the plays down in this area, anywhere in here. What the biggest tendency, and this is what I was saying to this young guy, unless the coach tells you otherwise, I don't really want to see a guy chase a guy coming down here because if the play's down here and you, and, and you say, well, you know what, I can get this loose puck right here and you go down and you don't, what that opens up now is now you're down here and this opens up this whole area of the ice, yeah. right? So if it comes out, yeah, now you're skating. Spot, yeah. And when I, when I notice when, when people get lost because they think they can maybe get a loose puck or help out, it's one mistake, and then you'll, that's where you'll see a shift where you're in your def- defensive zone for 30, 40 seconds or the puck's in the back of your net, or you just get tired out because you're chasing, and it's simply because this guy ch- thought he was going to help out. So when you see things, like, so for me, this is, a, this is a, your arse, your butt. Your butt is facing the net. Your stick is in the middle, and you have patience. So now if the, there's a loose battle here, there's your puck. So your feet are your feet are towards the walls. Yeah. So your feet are east and west, not north yeah. and south. Well, and if you look, if, if this is your ass, mm-hmm. it's a nice looking ass. Yeah, ass to right. the middle. Your stick is here. You can still see. You got a pretty good yeah. range of vision, right? Yeah, the old head on a swivel. Head on a swivel, <laughs> man. Hundred percent. So now, so but now the important thing is when there's a loose puck, and I don't like to get too d- below the dots. I don't like my winners because you got a centerman, you got D that can do that work. And if you go down, then you got, you know, one guy can beat three yeah. and one pass can beat the whole team. Mm-hmm. So when, the, when you do see the loose puck, it's get there really, really quickly. Now you can, now this is your job, mm-hmm. right? Or if the puck comes up to the D, now you just, it's, it's a couple of steps and you're there. Yeah. Maybe one other play just to touch on is if your D has the puck and walks down the wall. This guy? No, your D at the point. Okay, yeah, yeah. This is this yeah. offensive D. And that D starts to walk down the wall. Oh, down the wall. Right? Okay. So they have the puck coming down the wall. Yeah. So maybe you did that thing where you you went to the middle and you're flushing them yeah. towards the wall. Yeah. Do you how far do you chase that guy? This is guy? That, yeah. Is that well, your now, guy? Now it's your guy. Okay, but if he let's say he gets down below the hash marks. Are you chasing this guy? If he goes for a skate all the way around the net, are you chasing this guy? Or what well, are you doing? If he's if he's here and you're flushing him out, yeah, take him. Right? Take him. If he Ten. beats you though, gets lower. If he gets lower and he are you chasing clearly beats now? you? Or are you handing off? Well, or what like, do you think? that's that's right. there's a lot of situations there. I mean, yeah. if you've got two guys here, then probably not. But you keep your stick on his puck. If there's no mm-hmm. hitting, if there's hitting, you try to seal him off. But then you you should have a center and a D in this area yeah. to do it. But there's too many situations there to say that. And that, that's my point of bringing okay. that up. It's there's a this is where the you still have to be able to play hockey comes in. Where and I was saying this to you yesterday with when one of my old coaches used to say that he would give us a situation or a system that we need to run, and then someone would ask him, "Well, what if this?" Yeah. And he would basically give the answer you just gave. You got to read the play. You yeah. got to play hockey. You got to see where your guys yeah. are at. You have to communicate. And this yeah. is where that hockey IQ conversation starts yeah. again. Yeah. If, you, if you're committed to this guy and you're with him and there's nobody taking him and you're close enough where you can still engage in the battle, maybe it's a good time to go. Yeah. Maybe not. You got to see what's going on around you. Yeah. And if, you, it's, if your team does handoffs and that's what your coach is teaching, then you have to be able to make that handoff and not get out of position or get running around in your own zone. So that's yeah. why I wanted to bring that up is it's yeah. not all this stuff is going to be like a do this or do this. You still have to be able to read hockey. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then maybe the last thing in your D zone that I would feel is important. And again, it's the hard work is like short areas really is when the puck is on that. So if, if you're here in the, whatever you're, you're a forward, sorry, winger. Mm-hmm. Okay. And you're in this area and you do see a puck, the play starting to transition to your side. Right or you see maybe a rim's happening. Once you see it, now that's just a straight line, or maybe you're a little higher, depending on what your coach wants. It's just a straight line. It's not all kinds of work, but you need to get there fast. So one of the next things is that when you see, let's just say a D pulls out or a centerman pulls out with the puck and is going, what a mess this is, eh? You're doing fine. Mess, and, and they're coming this way. The, the thing now is, this is where hard work um this is a winger. This is where hard work makes a big difference. So if you see, if you see the tra- it's starting to transition, get there fast and get there hard. Like whatever, wherever area the coach wants you to be. Because if you lollygag about it, it you've made this guy's job harder, the, the winger or the centerman or the D. So if you get there quick, then as he's coming around, he can see you in position. So now that gives him an option right away. 
the other thing is it makes the other team have to work hard. So if you do this in a slow motion or like, you know, you're not urgent, then you, you've made yourself easy to play against. But once you see, okay, here's my, this is my chance to get open or to release, to give the guy, this guy an option. It's just another way of thinking about it. Mm-hmm. Like it's not about always, I want to get open. It's about, okay, this guy's it's, it's coming to the other side. I'm going to come out over here as fast as I can. I'm going to make them think, but I'm going to make this job, guy's job easier. So if I pull someone with me, I leave them a lane. Right. But, but the uh, bottom line is that you're given that you're given, you're giving your D or sediment who's carrying the puck an option quicker and you're making the other team work harder. If you go slow, they don't have to work hard. If you go fast, then you're forcing them to either get there or if they don't get there. Then you get to do whatever you want with the puck after. Yeah. So you're either, you're either an option or you're making space for somebody else. Right. And that's where you're kind of playing right. into the team. Yeah. The and team. don't forget the, the other thing is that you're making the other team work. Mm-hmm. So, so do you want to talk about maybe uh, like wall work a little bit or do, is that enough? You want to talk about getting pucks out, like that kind of conversation? Because that's well, something that Winger struggle with I, quite a bit. Yeah, I, I think Are that... Are going to go on the board or no? Uh, no, you don't need the board for this. Okay. As far as the wall work goes, this is where, as you can see, it's very important to just make sure that you know how to take rim pucks or how to take receive a pass off the wall, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I think that... I don't. I don't need to go into detail on that, but I think that if you practice taking pucks off the wall, like soft, hard, uh, using your stick, not your skates, um, and learning to either you know learning how to carry it, learning how to chip, learning how to send it through the middle, and just tons of reps with that, that that will help you just significantly. I'm talking for the youth yeah. levels. Yeah. As you get older, then it, it becomes a little bit more specific. Yeah, I think just maybe three different scenarios on the on the rim or not the rim, the taking pucks off the wall. One is the rim, being able to handle that. Two is getting a direct pass when you have pressure, without pressure too, but with pressure especially. So that'd be like kind of ass on the wall, getting it on your forehand. And then the third would be if it's gonna be a battle. So if the puck's coming up your wall and the, maybe the D's there, the F three comes down and being able to get in that battle. You have to be able to handle those three different situations. And then you mentioned that the picking the puck up with your skate thing. I never really understood that. Like what the only time that really makes sense to me is if if it's gonna be a battle. Like you can't get a clean stick on it. Like you go you go kind of eat it against the wall and wait for help. But I remember like I, I see that all the time as people teaching yeah, do you pick it up with your Old skate school. and yeah. then get your stick on it? So yeah. why would you do that? Why would you not? Like well, your yeah, stick? There's a lot of bad things can happen when you do your sta- skates. Yeah, and it, not to, it takes an extra two seconds to get it from yeah. your foot to your skate, yeah. like what, or from yeah. your foot to your. Yeah. Blade. You always want to. It's weird. Yeah, basically, if I'm a right winger, I'm just trying to think right. I'm yeah, right winger. Right winger, you want to as you're going to the going there, you want to do this. Right. You want to yeah, angle up, up like on a little it. bit of an angle mm-hmm. so that you can carry the puck a little bit. Now, as you do this little shoulder check to make sure you have an idea where. This guy's not right on you if he's backed yeah. up. Yeah. So, so, but yeah, one hundred percent good. Cool. That that was extremely thorough. Well done. Well, I hope it's 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 a lot and it's a little bit of a mess, but no, no. It's I think it's good and I think it'll be helpful no matter who is looking at it because this is this is what we talk. I was mentioning at the start of the episode is with parents is they think of hockey as skills. Yeah. They don't think of hockey as that, but that's okay. hockey. Okay. So yeah, let's let me just reiterate the D zone real quick. Mm-hmm. Okay. So to reiterate as a as a let's say a winger. So if I'm a right winger, this is basically my area. Yeah, I should go to, to go to the blue line. This is what I take care of right here. Uh, that's what I'm responsible for. Middle of the ice and out. If I if I chase down here, I open up the the spot that I'm responsible for, and that's where a lot of chaos happens. When the when the puck is on this side, if I drift, I open up that too much. So patience here, patience here, and then all your work is done basically from there. Yeah? Yep, great. Does that make sense? Yep, totally. And then... And that's um, offensively and defensively. It bo- it all well, starts it, from that. It, yeah, it starts... This is Yeah, so... And that's what I'm saying. Like, if you have patience of the pucks down in this, what, this corner and a puck squirts out now or your guy starts carrying the puck, a 10-foot pass, 15-foot pass, short pass is a lot easier to make or, you know, and the other thing is it, it, that's a lot easier to make and to get the puck out than to uh, it, than when you drift, okay? The other thing is, is that if you're here, like on the, you're the weak side winger, if a puck, if this offensive guy tries to move the puck, like let's say uh, to get someone in the slot or to the D, 
you're you have a much better chance of blocking that, yeah, intercepting stuck, it, yeah. getting in the way. Over if you if you if you're over here, then you have zero chance. So now it's just hard work, and then you run around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great, man. Great. Do you want to talk about a little bit about neutral zone stuff, or do you want to do something else? Um, I think I I, I could talk about uh back neutral zone like the new four check neutral zone to the to the back check yeah sure. just it's not gonna yep. take a ton no it's good okay you want board again i'm gonna use the board again okay. yeah so another area that i see and it was evident in uh this boy's clip but it's not he's not unusual um is neutral zone it's a little bit of a transition game so you've got the puck either neutral zone or you're or in the offensive zone mm -hmm. and the puck transitions and there and you have to back check so what back check leads to is defensive zone. So this is another area where you can be very, very effective. So let's just say the puck uh, is, is in this area and they go D to D and they carry the puck or they move the puck to this guy. And you're you're in the back check now. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're in back pressure. So you're coming as from the F1 spot? It doesn't even matter. It okay. doesn't even matter. Like if you don't know what you're doing or a habit to create is – to put as much pressure as on as possible. So where do you want to keep guys when you're back checking or where can they not score from is outside keep the them dots. outside the dots the best you can. Yeah. So you know you have your D here, right? They're, they're going to do their job. So if you come back as hard as you can through the middle. Now, if you're the first one back, you can help the D seal them off. But if you're not the first guy back, then what you want to do is you want to back check in, funnel through to, to here. Jeez, that's a mess. <laughs> You want to funnel through inside the dots. And I what I tell guys to do is to come back to the hash marks as hard as you can. So some people say, well, you might over back check. Yeah, that's fine. To yeah, me, that's I, better than under back yeah, check. A hundred percent. So what happens is even if you're not doing the right thing, like your coaches could say, okay, like then this is my point about being youth hockey. Okay. If you got three guys coming back as hard as you can to the middle of the ice with your two D here, you're in a pretty good spot. Because from here, let's say the puck, the guy does a Gretzky and comes back up here. Well, you got the D. Now you can sort yourselves out with short distances, right? So that's 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 what I find is very very important. Now, if you're the first guy coming back, then you could pressure with the D to help him out. Get your stick, moving your feet like crazy, getting your stick in there, helping this guy out, and then you got other two guys coming out. Now, to take it to the next level, would be coming back as hard as you can with the intent of who else is, who else am I watching? Like who's the dangerous guy? So if you're coming back hard and you know, there's three guys here, like, like a three on one here or something like that, then you got to be aware of where the, where the passage should be. But to me, the safest way is to come back really hard with a purpose, get to the hash mark area, put the brakes on and then sort it out and, and push guys out. So that's, that's, that would be one thing that I think, Guys that have really good back checks, you get noticed a lot, man. <laughs> like you notice, like you, you see effort. And uh, the beautiful thing about that, it goes, it, again, it comes back with time and space. If you come back quickly in bunches, then this guy, even though he might be really good, like a real skilled player, um, when, when he's going one against three, he typically is not going to be that good, right? So that's it's really important to get back really quickly, and then you're in those small areas again and and flush out real yeah. fast. I so. think two things two things on that. First, you can kind of see because we're talking a little bit about wingers, but you can kind of see when you get outside of your D zone, positions for forwards kind of dissolve. So outside of the face off, a lot of times it's whoever is in whichever spot, and you'll start to learn that as you get to older ages that there's not really a centerman in wingers outside of the initial puck drop. So I, you have an ideal setup for systems, but because the game, like we said, is fluid, who's F1? We don't know. It's not always going to be the centerman. Who's on the wall? We don't know. It could be a winger. It could be a centerman. So we, it's not really appropriate to talk specifically about one position because it can change. So you need to be able to read that. Again, this is the hockey IQ thing. If, you, if your coach explains a neutral zone forecheck or an offensive zone forecheck or a back check, and he's putting positions on everything. That's kind of, might be good just to get you started. Like you said, it's better to have everybody doing one thing than no structure at all. But you have to be able to understand sometimes it's not going to be you or other times it might be you. 
in a certain position. So it's not just the winger's job. It's not just the centerman's job. It's the forward's job. Once you kind of get outside your D zone, that's the first thing. Well, I just want to interrupt yep. you. That was, I'm really glad you said that because at the beginning of the thing, I wanted to mention that. I remember when I first started here in this area training guys, and I'd go watch a lot of, a lot of games. And I remember early, one of the first games I went to one of the, one of my really good customers too, he ended up getting drafted. Um, his dad was losing his shit because his son was a right winger and the left winger ended up in his corner a lot of the times. Mm-hmm. So he goes like, like, and he'd just be like, what is this guy doing? He's so stupid and all that. So I'm like, hey, John, listen, listen. It, that's an offensive play. You, whoever's first is first. That's what you call F1. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need pressure. It's not, you're not in one lane doing up and down right. and that's not your ice. I said, so now he's got to adjust. He's now maybe F2 or F3 and whatever the job is. I said, you're, you're, you're basically losing your shit for nothing. Mm-hmm. You're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> he goes, and he gave me a whole bunch of yeah, buts. And I'm like, well, maybe I forgot something about hockey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, but, 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 and this is, this is what happens with coaches or maybe parents that don't necessarily know. They will try and their intentions might be good they're trying to teach certain things but hockey is not one thing for everyone it's very there's a lot of crossover and changes that happen in in the heat of the game so if you say well the right winger should never be in that corner it's like what if a defenseman got caught in the offensive zone and the winger is the first guy back does the winger just not go to the corner first it's like then now now the guy goes to get the puck and walks right out because the D's not back yet, you know. So there's you have to be able to think hockey, and this is where when kids are young and skilled, they look like they're really good, and then as they get older and the game develops, and now their systems and structure, those kids that used to be really good, maybe they're not so good anymore because they don't actually know how to think hockey. They were just skilled first, you know, and that's that's an important thing to remember when you're the coach or the parents is you need to teach how to think the game. It's not about just how to do the do the top shelf or toe drag or skate through everybody because that isn't what hockey ends up being at the older ages. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing that you mentioned was um, how people notice good back checkers. And I just wanted to touch on this because someone sent me an email the other day and they asked, how come on scouting reports, it was something to the effect of how come on scouting reports, they never talk about the grinder guys that we like to talk about so much or grinder guys. I'm going to replace that with guys that do little things. Right. And basically I said to him is that's just completely not true. The scouting reports are on all these guys, these guys that do the little things, right. And that do the back checking, the finish hits, the block shots. They're always looking for those guys where you don't hear about it is in the in the newspaper article or on the news or in the media or the high draft picks that all the reporters are talking about that's where you don't hear about it all the scouts talk about it you know we talk to guys all the time and they're constantly asking about little things they're not just asking who scores they're not just asking who makes the the most plays if you're the elite end talent of course that's what they're looking for and those are the guys that get all the attention because that's the sexy job but they're constantly looking for those guys and they're scouting reports on all of those guys. And I don't, maybe it was a, in a response to, you mentioned the last episode or two episodes ago, you were talking to an NHL scout and how he was saying, it doesn't matter how many goals that guy gets. And we were talking about Tanner Jano and these types of players. And I think it was kind of like that, how that doesn't happen very often. And you no, know, the story doesn't happen very often. That doesn't mean it's not happening. So being really good at a back check is actually important. It doesn't go unnoticed. It doesn't matter what you hear about in the public discourse because the people that actually make the decisions, the coaches and GMs and scouts, they notice that and talk about it all the time. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny you say that because I know someone said something about Tanner Geno was not exactly an unknown. It's like, well, to most people he was because he, because no slight to him and no slight to the person that said that because he wasn't whatever year he is, he wasn't the first overall pick that people talk about. So the, the, that big grinder guy that um, uh, it, it, he just went a different, he got to the NHL a different way. That's what they were scouting. It wasn't about him scoring goals. It was about the other stuff. But he's not the unknown guy. You're not unknown. The, the, the guy that has to um, not be the first round pick is not going to get talked about. So the, the, the people don't talk. 
scouting and, and the media don't, don't talk about this, the, the lunch pail guy very often because there's a lot of lunch pail guys. It's being able to do everything really well. Right. Um, but yeah, so that's the thing is you got, you've got to be able to separate the hype machine, the, the, the TSN, the sports networks, the, all that stuff. And the, the people promoting the game and talking about the high end stars, because again, if you go, when you look at it, there's only a, a small percentage of them. And having said that, to be honest with you, a lot of guys that are muckers in the NHL were 50 goal scorers and 40 goal scorers and junior or high end scorers at a different level. So it's not like they're not good players, but they do the little things right. So you've got someone that's a really high skilled guy. Like Darren McCarty was one that played for the Wings, right? He scored 40 and 50, I think, in junior a couple times. High pick. He was like a, a more of a goal scorer machine, but that did all the other stuff. So when he went to the National Hockey League, he wasn't going to get 50 goals or 40 goals anymore. So he did the other stuff. And people just don't talk about that as much as they, as much as they maybe even should mm-hmm. to, for kids to learn and parents yeah. to understand the game within the game. So that was another comment I saw is someone saying most of these guys that are the lunch, we talk about that are the lunch pail guys were unreal when they were, kids and junior and stuff 100%. And for, for a lot of them there's a lot of that it's true for sure like a lot of those guys were fantastic players yeah. and then found a role because they weren't good enough at the skill game to necessarily be that top end skill talent yeah. in at the nhl level or at the professional yeah. level 100%. but there's there's also a ton of guys because the, the one guy told me that uh or the one guy was saying that jeno had 80 points or something in his last year of junior yeah and I was, I said, yeah. What about the five years before that, which is what we're talking about? So these these guys, they they evolve yeah. and they flourish over time. It's yeah. not so when we talk about young guys, if you're not the superstar point guy, that doesn't mean first of all, that doesn't mean one day you won't be. No, there's a long time for you to develop. And the second thing is, even if you don't, there's always stories about the, these guys that weren't that and made it. Matt Martin, yeah. the the Jack oh, guy story. Even them, he got thirty goals in junior. Well, yeah, but, he, but he's playing with Steven Stamkos yeah. last year. Yeah. But coming up, he was not a points guy. He wasn't a triple A guy. Yeah, he wasn't even a triple A guy. So and we know because f- we train here. Yeah, so you, you can find whatever story you want is my yeah. point. Yeah. You know, you can find the story of any of those guys. But yeah. I just wanted to bring bring up the point that it doesn't go unnoticed. Yeah. Because if if Darren McCarty scores 50 goals in junior and that's all he does, but that doesn't translate to a pro game, right. then he doesn't make it. That's but right. he had those other things. That's right. You know, so we, t- we That's talk about the major thing. Yeah, we talk about that a lot. Yeah. And then th- to keep that in perspective is like in the in the junior hockey, you got an age gap of 16 to 21. Mm-hmm. So at 21, you should be getting goals. If, if you're the oldest guy in the league or one of the oldest guys in the league, the, yeah. the offensive game should be a little bit easier for you. So if you had five your first year, you're probably going to be 20 cool. to 30 or 40. Right? How about Hunter Smith? There's a guy. Mm-hmm. So he's a, you want to talk about lunch pail guy. This yep. is lunch pail guy. Yep. But his last year in Oshawa, he had 70 points or six, something yeah. like that. Yeah, he had a really sure. great, great offensive year yeah. Yeah. his last year. And I think maybe the year before that, he did pretty well too. Yeah, I can't remember. But, second last year. But, but he's not, a, he, he wasn't an offensive player in terms of what his role should be on a team. The fact that he got points doesn't necessarily mean that you're the point guy. It's just he's on a top line and the oldest guy. So you're going to get some. You know, so anyways, a little, little side tangent there. Okay. So like, I believe that games are won and lost in the neutral zone. I believe that a lot because that's, uh, you, you can have a lot of turnovers and transitions and stuff like that. So being a good uh, guy, and I know it's not, not sexy at all, right? But being a good neutral zone guy, um, that's either through your back checking or uh, through, through uh, defending. So the the key and this this is the same principle in the offensive zone is like as you defend in the offensive zone and neutral zone is that you're on top of the puck. Okay? So uh for example, let's say it's a D to D it doesn't I'm just giving one example this the puck goes over to this D what you want to make sure so if they have their I'll just put them as X's like something like this. If we have too many guys like we want to be above the puck or above their player. So we got to make sure that if that puck comes loose, we have guys on top of them to defend. If, if they get behind you, then 
it's one quick pass. So <clears throat> one of the things that I always talked about is I learned this. I didn't learn this until much later is I used to go down the ice really, really hard. Let's say, take this guy. Cause no one, no one said anything. I'm already in junior. And I go at this guy and he would wait, wait, wait. And he'd either throw it across or send it here. But I'd, I'd go hard. Right. So what your goal should be is to keep the puck somehow get this guy to keep the puck to the outside and force him up outside the dots. That should, that should be your number one goal. So if I'm the first guy in the neutral zone, this is where instead of going directly at him, where I give him options to go this way or that way, if I can go in patiently and actually get my stick in this lane and then start steering him, he has no choice but to come up here or make that play. Does that make sense? Yep. So, so that just made my job easier. And now if he gets moving up the ice, then I can, you know, I start following it up and then we got guys that can take him to the outside. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. So it's like, now that's not every system, obviously. And I'm not talking systems here. I'm just talking a principle. So if you, if you're, if there's two guys, then it's kind of the same thing. You're staying on top of the puck, but what you always want to do is your body position is get on top of the puck or on top of the players. And then it's more reaction. You steer and react, right? So like if the puck, you got two guys here, we're X's now. It's like same thing. This guy's got the puck and I want to just take an inside lane to steer him out. That's, that's the principles of yep. a neutral zone because you're, the guys are not, da not as dangerous on the outside and they're a heck of a lot more dangerous on the inside. So you're just you're in shooting sure. areas, right? There's more options, the, the more of the middle of the ice that you give them. Yeah. So okay. yeah, principles. You were the yeah. whole goal is you're trying to keep guys outside. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's that's that. And that's that would be the same as the four checking in the okay. offensive zone. So then, zone. if we go, let's say we we're now transitioning into the offensive zone. Yeah. So maybe you want to start from the neutral zone. So like, if we have the puck now in the neutral zone, and I'm a winger. We have the. Uh, hang on, I want to just do one more thing in the neutral zone specifically so one more thing in the neutral zone specifically to a right winger more or less so if uh if i'm a right winger and I, I i you know this is where you have to read a little bit so i'm a right winger and let's say my centerman is steering a guy the d whatever this d this d so let's say it goes to this d and this guy's steering him out then i just have to have my patience like i got to look at where is the x on the other team like stay above him not behind him or inside like so in the in the defensive side of him so that if he does move it up it's a couple quick things rather than steering to the middle and if he i'm a right winger and the, the d on this side has the puck and the, like the flow of the game is going this way then again we're not we don't want to stay outside now we want to get in the middle of the ice typically this is different systems but typically i want to get in the middle of the ice so that if he makes a play i'm already there rather than being on the outside. So that's pretty simple. Okay. What did you want me to transition to now? So if we're, if, so now if like we now have the puck, so that's kind of like defensive zone yep. or D zone yep. or D, yep. sorry, D side of yep. the neutral zone. Yep. So now if we are flipping to the offensive yep. side, so like, let's say we like RD, we're doing a D to D regroup or a neutral zone yep. regroup of some or sort. Or a rush of anything. Yeah, a rush yep. of anything. Okay. So now we'll go offensive side of the neutral zone and then that'll lead us into the, yep. the offensive right. so zone. So we're coming into the ice? Yep. What do you want? I'm the right winger. Yeah, right winger. Well, first let's say like if our D, if our D have it. So if it's a D to D up D the wall, D. whatever. So coming what's on our, your yeah. side. Yeah, coming to your side. Now this this you can either be low for a quick pass and a um, like a low short pass, and then you'll see a lot of pro junior or college and stuff where they stretch it. So that's but you basically want to be close to the wall on either of those situations. It's going to be system dependent. Okay. Yep. So, and then what about far side? If puck's so going the youth, other way, but just one sec. So yep. for youth hockey, typically if it's a D to D, and the flow is going this way, then typically you're going to be a lot lower. So it's an easy pass, unless the coach says stretch, then you're up here. But typically that's it, and your center comes low enough so you can make passes. The systems aren't as tight as in junior. If it's on the other side, then uh, so now it's. D to D or the rush is going this way, then you're kind of getting inside the dots here the best you can. Right? Yeah. Unless their coach tells you otherwise. Unless your coach tells you some, otherwise. Sometimes 
another play that as you get older that coaches do, it's either you're sla- kind of slashing across yeah. Yeah. or they'll have you stay down for that cross seam kind of yeah. play as a yeah. winger on the low yeah. side. Right? A lot of that stuff is dependent on what your yeah, coaches want. Sure. So, But the bottom line is if it's coming to your side, you got to get on that wall unless mm-hmm. they say release, but that's typically not how guys do it anymore. Um, and if it's on the other side, then you can cheat to the middle a little bit more and your objective is to yep. get the puck deep or go to the net. Sure. So what side do you want to go on now? So let's go. You're entering? Yeah, let's do entry. So Who's got the puck? Let's say you have the puck. Okay, you've got the puck. You're a right winger. Now you're looking at options. Now, if you have the puck, the number one thing to do is, okay, now it's, now you're, if you want to have someone's job be easy on you, stay right along the wall because now that's you're easy to play. Okay. That doesn't mean you can never do it, but when you do have the puck, what you do want to do is kind of, if you can get closer to the dots, if you're carrying it, if you can get closer to the dots and, and, and what that does is gives you options inside, outside mm-hmm. and chips okay, and all pause. that kind of stuff. So, yeah. so th- this, I want to just point this out. So when we were talking about the defensive side of the puck, this is why it's important that you understand the de- defensive game and you understand different positions because if you're playing defensively what we've been saying this whole time is you're trying to keep guys to the outside you're trying to eliminate time and space you want to keep them outside the dots now we're flipping the page we're talking about offense and we're saying you want to get to the dots so that you have more options and more time and space so this is where it's smart for you to understand yeah, flip the page the, the defender is trying to keep you to the outside so you don't want to play into what they want because it's easy if you're along the wall you have no time you have no space you have no options easy to seal you off so that's why it's important. You can say, oh, okay, I know the D are trying to get me to stay on the outside if they know how to play defense, right? So if you get get yourself closer to the middle, now you have, you can go either way, you can make plays and you have options. Yeah. Well, and just so, so as you said that, so one of the clips of uh, uh, that we did the other day with that, that guy is he had the puck, the right winger, he was coming in and he had some pretty good speed and there was the D and another player. Okay. So... This is like real simple. Like you actually can't go to the middle right now if there's pressure there. So you have to keep it to the outside. So one of the golden rules of hockey is you don't try to do too much at the blue line. So if you don't have that play, what he tried to do is try tried to beat them. And then what, guess what happened? Turnover. Well, yeah, 99% of the times. Now he's back checking, right? So now this is just understanding hockey. If the D is really up on you, you don't have the speed to beat them or you do or whatever, and you have more pressure. Then what I was telling them is that a simple play like that is you just chip it, soft chip it, or read if you got someone with you. Well, that could be a pass, but read if uh, you have someone with you to, to get it a little deeper that he can get it or you chip it so that you can get it. Mm-hmm. So you just don't want to play at this blue line. And then your defensive zone either. You don't want to do any stick handling here. Either. Yeah. You want to either get it out or make a play or chip it out. So it's and, just safe hockey. Yeah, and then other point thing I want to point out is how we've been saying it, it, a lot of this stuff depends on your coach and what they want because I remember with one of my coaches just inside the blue line, he actually he liked us the guys that were skilled enough to make plays, he liked us making plays in that area. So if we could tripod one of their defensemen and make a pass through them or, t- or tuck it behind For them sure. or soft chip behind them, he liked that. And if you have the ability to make that play, that's good. But some coaches really don't like that. And they don't want to ever see you try to make a play around that blue line area. So chip and go is, is a better play. So this is where you also need to, as you've been saying, understand what your coach wants and what the, what the team system is. Because if you think, well, I'm good enough to make this play through the middle, it's like it doesn't matter. That's not what the coach wants. So you're going to get in shit every time if you do it, even if you're good enough to pull it off. So you need to, again, hockey IQ, understand the game, understand your team and what they're asking for. Yeah, yeah. so so the bottom line is this, if you're carrying the puck and there is maybe a D is giving you ice, then you take the middle and you, and you carry it. Mm-hmm. If you're getting pressured at the blue line and you, you can't make plays, basically is what I'm saying, then get the puck a little deep and then because you know what you're doing and then go get it and then you manage the puck from there and then obviously if you have if if you're the right winger and you have a centerman here with not a lot of pressure or even a little bit then that would be the play because there's more options right so that's obviously you got to think about it but bottom line is try to get to the middle of the ice so you have options uh if he if he gives you some gap then you obviously can skate a little bit more and that's the bottom line. And if you mm-hmm. don't, chip it in. Okay, so let's go, if you don't have the puck now, entry. So the puck is either, 
the centerman has the puck, the left winger, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Like what I would tell people, it's hard to find kids at a young age, let alone at older ages that are willing to do the hard work of going to the net. And in the clips with this, this uh, uh, young guy that I did, it was evident that he, um, he did kind of one time he went to the net kind of hard, but then he didn't have a stick on the ice. But for the most part, um, if, if we enter like, right wing here if we kind of enter in a straight line like this like all lateral then it's hard to make plays anyways um, but what you want to do is create options of of uh, getting to the net so once you you should read if maybe the centerman or someone else goes to that but be or be excited and be um, determined to be the first guy to the net and go hard because what happens is that's where a lot of guys don't get pucks, right? So if you come in on a three on two, two on two, whatever, and let's even just take a two on two like this. And if we're on this at the same, um, on the same line, same yeah. line, then there's, there's no plays to be made. It's easy to play against. So I just say like, if you don't have the puck, be the guy that's willing, unless the system tells you differently to get to the net, like get, go to, through the, the, like cut through and get there as hard as you possibly can. Because the bottom line is, is whoever has this puck, um, if they just decide to shoot, let's say you're like, we talk, this is what we're talking about. You're playing with, let's say you're playing with uh, uh, a left winger. God, I need longer arms, left winger. So the puck comes out here and this guy's the most selfish player in the whole world. Okay. And, and you can get frustrated with this guy because you, you know, he's the guy that's going to shoot and try to score the goal as well. If you drive to the net quickly, if he shoots, well, there, there, there it is. There's, there might be a, uh, a rebound. There might be a tip in. Might be accidentally off your ass, or he scores, which is good. You've done your job, and you've taken these guys. You made this defenseman think, or this defenseman think that oh, this guy's going to the net. And if they don't think, then you've got a free pass. Mm-hmm. But what I see for for at a lot of levels of hockey is there's the guy that wants to get to the net is they either do it kind of get to the net like lackadaisical or like almost unwilling or not really determined but the guys that get to that net really really hard with their stick down um number one it makes the other team have to work hard number two it creates a lot of options for you Mm -hmm. and this a lot of goals are scored just by rebounds and shit like that Mm -hmm. and then the other thing is if there is loose box back here you're already there yeah. So it's just it's a, such a good habit to get to that net with your stick down. Because if this, if one of these guys decide to slap pass it to you or pass it to you, you're, you're ready and you're ready to shoot or ready to play. Yep. Right. So getting to the net is like a huge, huge thing for me. Now, having said that, if you have, unless a coach tells you otherwise, if you see like maybe you're the third guy and the the centerman or the winger, whichever one is going to the net, then you might want to just creep in inside. The honey hole. Yeah, now you're that F three ish yeah. guy. Yeah. Now you yeah. And now the other thing now is now you're in good defensive position yeah, I was if you gonna lose say that. Yeah. So yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh yeah, I think that that's that's good. Do you want to talk about um as a last thing or or no? Uh like some oh, like offensive zone possession? Um I'd rather I'd Or is rather, it just too too much? It, too, it's too much. Here's what I would like here's what I would like to say. If done there no. Uh I'm gonna do yeah. Here's what I like to say about uh, your offensive zone, just positioning more or less, mm-hmm. not possession because there's too many, too many, too many yeah. variables, but like just real simple. I want to keep this as simple as I can. If I, hopefully I did so far, you're a right winger. If the puck is in this corner, let's just say what, and this was uh, what this young guy did too. He was like kind of either in right in the middle of the ice or he would creep out like out here. Okay. So what happens is basically the defenders are all in this area anyways. So you've just made getting a pass or making a play really hard. So what I would say to do, and coaches could say otherwise, is when the play's in this corner is not necessarily tight to the net, but maybe a little higher. We call it Some guys call it the honey hole. That's what I like to call it. Like it's in this area, higher slot, because now if a puck comes out, like you're stick ready you can get a shot you can you can get a little bit more open here rather than where all the traffic is so i would say that and then the other side of that is if you're the right winger here and a puck squirts loose in any of these areas you're in a good position to get loose pucks right whereas if you're over here you're not you're going to be back checking hard right so you got numbers in there without having numbers right and then obviously 
the other side of it would be when you're forechecking. So let's say a D's getting a puck and you're forechecking, the same principles apply. Where do you want to where do you want to steer this guy? Right? So you don't want if you come at him this way or down the wall like this, you want to be on the defensive side. So you don't if you're if you're going straight on or whatever or steered him this way, then he's he's got options. You, you, he wants to come up here or behind the net where it's safe. So if you can, what you want to do is you always want to get take away this the lane here. So if this is the D, take away this this lane and start steering him up the wall, and you get your stick on the puck, right? And then and then always when you're trolling around in the offensive zone, like I sk skater out their stick in the air, and then when a puck comes to them, it's like it's almost an element of surprise. So when you're in the offensive zone, have your stick, if it's not on the ice, real close, ready to shoot or make a play. And if you do that, you get yourself a lot better chance of uh, making plays. Yeah, sweet. You know? that, was, uh, that was extremely thorough. I don't know. We did everything that I tr tried to do. Okay, so so, a couple, couple things as a, kind of a wrap-up. We, yeah. we talked about our D zone playing away from the puck. We did some D zone coverage, being in a good support spot, face-offs, breakouts. Neutral zone, we did coverage, four checks, regroups. Then offensive zone, we did entries. We did four check, talked a little bit about F3, and um, we talked about back checking also. And then we did all that with the puck too, if you're in a different position. So what I want to highlight is, as you kept saying the entire time, none of the stuff that you talked about is set in stone. Everything can be dependent. If your coach tells you something different, it could be different. These are just general principles to play hockey well in the position that you're in. Yeah. So things can change. If you run a different system, maybe something we said doesn't apply. And that could very well be the case. And I know of several times where it wouldn't be the case, what we said, because we know different yeah. systems, yeah. you know? Yeah. So that's, that's well, kind of... So like, but so like, oh, the offensive zone. Okay. So just to, when I was saying about the, when the puck's in the far corner, the, the your weak side corner, like by getting to that half of the ice, the higher half of the ice, what that does for you is that if there is a loose puck, now you're defensively sound. Like it, the, the game is like the more defensively sound you are, will create more offense. So like you can get those loose pucks and you can keep the puck in or you can defend well and it gives you more opportunity to have the puck on your stick. Yeah. So that's why I want kids to be really aware of that. And as you said, it's like, this isn't how uh, you play every shift necessarily, but it's the foundation and the basics of it. If you understand short areas and just like your, it, like your, your D zone, that, that understanding that quadrant that you have, if you want to call it that, if it changes with another team, that's fine. But if you do that as the basis of basics of hockey, you do it well and do it hard you will be around the puck more and you have a better chance of yeah. looking good and having the puck during the game Yeah, and and be and in the play more. And if you understand a lot of this foundational stuff, you'll be able to learn the next system more easily because you understand all of these little things we talked about, where you're on the ice, what your role is, what your job is. So if the job slightly changes or you're given a different assignment, you still have some context of where you started from. Whereas if somebody just throws a new system at you and you don't even know the basics of what you should be doing, it's really hard to understand why you're doing the thing that you're doing. So this is just a good place to, to start from. So I think hopefully so. hopefully that was helpful. Uh, anything else for you? Uh, no, I think I'm good. Okay, I have a quote I'm going to end on again today. Okay. This is an Elon Musk. Okay, that's the guy you want to have dinner with. Yeah, I would have dinner with Elon Musk. Yeah. It'd be a great talk. If it you would want, be interesting, for sure. It'd be weird. If you heard yeah. him talk. Yeah. Hard to listen to. Yeah. But fascinating brain. Yeah. Um, here's the quote that I picked. If you want to grow a giant redwood, yeah. You need to make sure the seeds are okay. Nurture the sapling, which I just found out is a word. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't know. <laughs> no. And work out what might potentially stop it from growing all the way along. Anything that breaks it at any point hinders or stops that growth. That's my quote, 10 today. I like that one. Okay, I like so, it. See you guys next week.